Uh, hello. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, hi, so my name's Steven. Um, I've been making computer games for 10 years, I guess. I, the one I'm working on at the moment is called 10 Beautiful Postcards. It's one of the games in the, um, the arcade selection below. Um, I guess the main thing I'm thinking of when I'm making it is like, it's still a video game, but I really want to make it as a CD-ROM and like do the whole thing with like physical packaging, even if I have to make it myself and distributing it locally as a physical thing. And I think that's like a really stupid, like atavistic idea like at this point because it's just a lot of effort and no one really... It's just not going to work, but I figured I'd like, talk some about why I'm trying to do it anyway. Um, so it kind of started out of the... Um, oh, I forgot to put this up. <laughs> wow. So it started out of the remnants of a different bad decision made around like five years ago called Grab Gradle. So this was, I think, on in Fantastic Arcade as well a couple of years ago. And this was kind of a, a dungeon crawler e thing. So I'm going to load it up now because... There are maybe two things that it kind of does very noticeably. And the first thing is this kind of horrible noise, which we're going to hear in like a second. I'm just going to turn it down just so it doesn't blow out the speakers or anything. Hmm. So that's the noise. <laughs> It plays every couple of seconds, like over and over. That's a copyright protection system. So this was the first 3D game I made, and it was like made as an excuse to play around with. It was um, made in collaboration with the artist Winter Lake and New Vaders, who's doing the music that you probably can't hear because of the honking. And um, it was kind of done as an excuse to play around with some of the weirder aspects of like old like Western RPGs, like the description boxes which don't match up with anything you see on the screen, the unintelligible systems that are going on in the background, like there's a prey mechanic like in Stone Shoop. But also one thing it has is the um, of course, I like video games. So one thing it has is like Wasteland 1, it has a paragraph book. So this is like a HTML thing that came with the game. So every so often you'll be instructed to go to a certain paragraph to receive more information. So that comes in a helpful little book that comes in here. So I think this is um, let's see, LXI. So if we scroll down to LXI, we can find... So there's a description of playing a video game like you press the buttons, like there's a sweaty little man looking at you. There's an electronic screen that's like flailing at you. And then if you want to continue playing the video game, you can like check these other paragraphs. So CBI. I don't know what the Roman was <laughs> mean at this point. I'm afraid. Yeah, there's a description like electronic buzz. That's what the video game is. But um, so that was like an enormously time consuming kind of peripheral thing just thrown in the background of this like janky kind of free PC game. And kind of, I think the next obvious step for that was the idea of like actually doing it up as a physical book. So just kind of making a zine out of the paragraph book. So that's kind of what I did that same year because it was like a Dublin um, zine fair. And that's where I'm from. And Dublin isn't really like a big town for that kind of thing. Like in general, it's kind of a small event or maybe 20 other people there. Or like it was the only video game there. And um, mostly it was just kind of like people who were walking by and who wandered in to have a look at what was going on. And I made like slip cases for the CDs and I made a bunch of other peripheral stuff like maps and instruction guides and so forth. And I heaped it all on yellow tape at the zine fair and figured like I'd try to show it off to people who wouldn't otherwise see video games. And the experience was really interesting to me because I found like a lot of the people who talked to me didn't know that video games still existed. Like it was like I had set up a table where like I'd spent the last five years making pogs and like here are my homemade pogs. <laughs> or like Tamagotchis or Forbes or something like, like they're still making Tamagotchis because they'll never die. But um, like these consumer media formats that are like officially meant to have gone away, that like lost some degree of relevance, but like maybe they linger on like some kind of distant corner as like a, um, I know this kind of like shadow, non canonical self, like you still get bootleg pogs produced somewhere probably because there's always a market for something. You can still find video games like being produced despite everyone's best efforts in like a shady flea market or something like that after everyone stopped caring, of course. So that was really exciting to me because um, people were kind of engaging with these games. Oh, and I did it. Oh, sorry. I think it's skipping ahead. Um, I'll show you some of the other ones as well. Because I did this twice. Like I came up with a different game a couple of years later. And 
I did the same thing with like a set of packages. Here's me with my packages. And they're very cheap. So a lot of people bought them and a lot of other people just kind of looked at them and moved on with that suspicious expression. But um, yeah, so it was important to me because like I said, I kind of grew up in Dublin and video games were always kind of from somewhere else. So they kind of seemed like a foreign culture and they always seemed like the remnants of a foreign culture, which I didn't have access to. Like the Super Mario video game seemed like a product to tie into some other Super Mario property, which I just hadn't experienced at all. And um, yeah, it was like people talk about video games or their childhood or whatever it was. For me, it was like video games were someone else's childhood that I just kind of like accidentally intercepted. Like they're just being distributed and then I just kind of got in the way and I got these like leavings of something else that had gone past. And I had a lot of affection for that because I feel like, especially in like consumer culture, there's kind of an increasingly crowded market for attention and so forth. And part of that is like an increasingly crowded like amount of people telling you what you should be interested in, what you're like, it's always kind of wishful to an extent when someone markets like a Sonic game, they're not saying like, if you like Sonic, you should play this. They're saying like, why can't you be the kind of person who likes Sonic? And then you can kind of like engage in this property. There's always like an element of like, pushing at you to see if you fit this form. Whereas like, I think what I found valuable about them was like their forms of culture that were kind of too unintelligible to reconstruct what kind of self image they seem to be engaging with. Like I could not figure out what kind of audience draw for these things. I couldn't figure out who they were made for or by. Like I could not reverse engineer an image of what I was supposed to be feeling from them. So I kind of liked that blankness and I kind of, as years go by, I kind of, got more and more into other similar things. Like this is like a Mingering Mike LP album. I think he was like a teenager in Washington DC in the 60s. And he didn't have like his own recording studio where he made like his own cardboard record sleeves just describing an entire 10 year career. So this is like his, his nasty album apparently. And he did some other fake soundtracks for fake music. And they'd all just be like cardboard sleeves and then a cardboard record inside of like grooves drawn on in pen. And other things like, um, this is, I think, Robert Vince's IMDb page, just the top part of it. So it goes back to 1989, and like all of his movies are either sequels to Airbuds or else kind of <laughs> Airbud derivative movies, like Treasure Buddies, Spooky Buddies, like Space Buddies, No Buddies. <laughs> and um, like I've never seen any of these, and I never want to. But there's something very soothing to me about knowing that it's there, that it's just like an alien form of culture that has no grasp on me. It's just like this empty cultural space, like a vacant parking lot or something like that. So I kind of liked the idea that I could be performing a similar role to people in my area, like a viable social skill, like clearing the ground so that they could figure out what they actually were interested in instead of just like helplessly picking up from everything around them. Um, so I decided like one idea I always had in the back of my mind was to try and create like a Potemkin video game culture. So a video game culture which didn't actually exist, but which if people had no interest or like engagement with it before, they could like maybe think that it did exist. And like, it wouldn't be like an entrance point. It would be just like, they'd have it in the back of their mind as something that was out there. And then they'd move on to do other things that they are more interested in and more productive than playing video games. So yeah, so I had that in the back of my mind and I kind of started thinking about other things, which would be, you know, the ideal, if I was going to construct a fake video game culture, like what parts would I put in it? Like what, because video games are like, it's a medium that kind of like based on the future, like games are still kind of ranked on what, not what they are, but what they can lead to. But like, it's also 30 years or 40, or 60, whatever it is, years old. There's a lot of futures that kind of got discarded. Like this is, um, one of three Duncan's games, Chop Suey. And this is like a multimedia CD-ROM from the 90s. And it was like produced as part of a, a wave of like Go software. So they'd have these like use multimedia constructions, like all these houses, you can go into them. Each one would be like a little diorama within that you could click on different things like the cat, the menu, like you'll play animations, you'll play sounds. It was very use. It was very like horizontally ordered instead of vertically ordered. So you didn't have to like complete the menu in order to touch the cat. You could just play with them however you wanted. Um, I thought about You May Nikki, which is not a like popular game. Like most people have heard of it, but it's an OPG micro game about exploring kind of these dreamlike surroundings. But it's also like very popular with, you know, the kids. <laughs> like there are a lot of You May Nikki fan games and like fan fiction and so forth. And it's just extremely surreal, mysterious game, but it kind of has this following. 
and I thought I was finding other stuff which kind of seemed to link the two worlds. Like, this is some of Suzanne Trice's art from the 90s, or maybe the late, late 80s. So she was a visual artist who kind of picked up an Amiga and who used, I think, Lux Paint 2 to kind of paint these fictional video game screens. And, like, they're these kind of mixture of, like, a very heavy textured thing and, like, a very ostentatiously gamey thing. Like, there are these buttons, so this is kind of alarming, very video gamey text. But there's this kind of, like, rich density to the, like, the way it's drawn, to the, the carpet texture and so forth. So this kind of seemed to me like a bridge between, like, cd or multimedia art and, like, the dreamy or, like, more textural landscapes of something like Yumi Nikki. And another thing it made me think of, like, the CD-ROM thing was that if I was going to do it, I could do it through games for kids because kids don't know what's real and what's not. Like, there's that article that went around about, like, the fake, the pregnant Elsa Spider-Man videos where, like, there's some Russian, or well, not Russian, but, like, some like, commercial algorithm deciding to just mash buzzwords together in order to get kids to kind of click on the videos and see what happens. And it's kind of very avant-garde and very beautiful. But it's kind of the stuff where, like, it couldn't, if you're making that kind of stuff in the adult world, it kind of gets flagged as surreal and experimental and so forth, whereas for kids, it's just like for kids, nobody cares. There's no, nobody is paying attention to that area of culture. And it's also easier to like sell, I think, because you can just like hawk that stuff and like no one is paying that strict attention to it, it seemed to me. So I decided I would kind of, my next project would be, or well, not my next project, but a couple years down the line, I would move towards producing a video game for kids that I could put on a CD-ROM. So I'm just gonna like play it. Um, I won't have anything to say without when I'm actually playing it, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, oh, I didn't put it here. Excuse me. But yeah, I'm just gonna blast through it because there's a lot of detail it's like available downstairs. Um, I don't think a lot of, like the stuff that goes into a game is generally not you can't really talk about it because you spend like 90% of your time trying to figure out like what you're trying to do or what you're meant to be doing. And then as soon as you open the other way, so you're just like, oh, that looks good. Oh, I think it would be cool if I could do this. And you're just like flailing around. And then like you wake up after the game's released and you're like, what did I do? How did I not do this again? So um, it starts off in the void because I think there's like a throwback to the gamers because I think what makes someone a video game player is that they love the void, they admire the endless black voids. They want to experience the void on their personal computers. Um, and this is like the main screen. So you can see it's, I'm just gonna like speed run mode it. Like there's no point paying attention to the text because no one can read video game text anyway. It's not actually text, it's like a texture. Like you have to read every sentence in the video game three times before you're able to like pass it as human language. Um, case, case in point, like you see this and the first thing you see is like, do I need to read this? Is it just like flavor text or two tip or something? And then you're like, oh, okay, I guess I gotta read this. So like, I just scan it and see like, uh, hotel, test card, world, hotels, 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 hotels. You're just like, and then if you can't figure out what it's meant to be saying from that, then you have to actually like set your mind down to actually reconstruct it as actual language. But that's like a worst case scenario, which <laughs> generally video game best practice is trying to avoid. So I'll go through the force like, loop it's called 10 beautiful postcards the arbitrary structuring mechanism for the game is there are 10 beautiful postcards you visit these postcards at the end of the game you'll be asked to tell the monster which was your favorite and it will thank you and close the game <laughs> so you might have noticed that's very like messy looking and very sloppy and that the camera isn't really like the main character keeps like wandering out of the camera frame. Not here, but like in some of the bigger levels. Also, there's no bounds on it. So like, if you wanted to, I could just put it like this and you just keep going forever. Which makes it great to play at, like public events because there's always someone who decides to test like how far you can actually go and you can just go forever. I'm not gonna stop you from chasing your dreams. <laughs> but it's very exciting to watch people play. And yeah, I try, I've tried to kind of go through um, because I'm a very lazy person and a lot of my video game practice is based on laziness. So just trying to do like as little as I can to get the effects I want. So I have a lot of old prototypes sitting around. So I'll maybe show some of them. And if there's something I wanted to do, I just like take it, drop it in, maybe fix some parts so it's about hotels now instead of whatever. And then, um, yeah, just kind of move on to the next thing. 
So I guess the main three elements you might have noticed so far, like it's very visually messy and like unstructured. And um, there's this kind of weird camera thing on, but like this sort of level of floatiness, like these sprites keep like popping in and out of pixel perfectness. Um, and also there's a lot of different like textures in there, like there's pixel art, there's drawings, there's like this Google image search of a lamp <laughs> because I was too lazy to take a picture of a real lamp. This is beautiful texture in the background. And so part of what I wanted from the idea of like multimedia was just a totally empty framework where I could just, whatever I felt like doing, like if I just like wanted to paint and watch Netflix or something, I could just do that. And then at the end, I just like throw it in, like whatever, that's level. So just like finding something where, which was just like discombobulated enough as a format that it would kind of accept any variety of content whatsoever. And this is like a good example of what I mean by the camera jankiness. So, all the mechanics mostly are 2D, but the camera is 3D, so it kind of follows you around, and then depending on the Z order, stuff kind of floats in and out of the vision. So I'll talk a bit about why I do that after I get to the first postcard. This is very, like this is one of the zones I want to actually take out or redo, because it's a bit much, and sometimes it just catches people trying to actually read the text, and I'm like, I want to spare them the effort. So here's the, po oh, the first postcard, or one of the first postcards. Uh, hopefully you have, will be like moved out of this address by the time the game is released. So if anyone wants to send like bombs to it or something like that, they can feel free. Um, let's see. Eventually it loops around because the entire game structure will be like, kind of like you and Nikki, like you explore, you see new things. You um, maybe find something else, to like unlock some kind of new door and then it kind of dumps you back into some main hope world. So here we are back in the hope world. I love being the center of attention as well. <laughs> so that's the, um, I guess, the main structure of the game. So I'll talk about the, I talked about the, the way that the art style is kind of based on the desire to just be able to move fluidly between whatever I felt like at the time. And also because I like that sense of texture, but also kind of like a texture offset by kind of a basic void quality to video games. Like this yellow background isn't actually a background. There's just empty space. Like all these people just like lock to a Z axis so they don't fall down forever, but they're not standing on anything in particular. And they're all like these colorless spread out lines so that if they kind of stand over something with color, they could just like absorb it. So this is kind of quite of, that these kind of empty shapes just projected onto a void, but then the void can also have these like surprising elements of sudden new texture or something kind of that catches it that's unrelated to anything that's actually going on. Um, so both of those were important to me because it also has a certain visual quality that I liked and that I think I don't really play that many video games anymore. And I think that's because I find them exhausting to look at. Like in most video games like you're staring at, you play as like a yellow guy in the middle of the screen or like a real reticule, yellow reticule in the middle of the screen. And like whatever you do, you're like looking at the ridicule, like in um, God, the crowd or something like that. Like as noisy as that was visually, like you're always just like staring at this little toad guy. Like you're experiencing all this space as it occurs to this little toad guy. Whatever happens in the game, you're still like locked to looking at that toad. You're spending a lot of energy just like staring at something that isn't really, I like the art, but it's like not worth staring at for two hours or whatever it is. So I wanted to make something else to kind of like, um, you can see it in Goblet Crowd where like, it has a text box here. So if you're tired of looking at the frog, you can look at the text box, you can look at some buttons, but you're still kind of mostly experiencing the game world as the frog. So I want to make something which is more kind of dislocated so that if you felt tired of looking at something, you, I could just roam around. You want to lock to looking at one particular thing. It was like more visually open. And it kind of connected to the, um, the alternate histories idea as well, because in terms of things like old GeoCities pages and stuff like that, they could be very inventive about the way they portrayed space so that they had like text dumped around in like various mysterious spaces or just kind of like the way they organize buttons or the way they expect you to scroll down or across to a certain extent could be very loose and creative. And that kind of got lost when it became kind of ossified into, you know, the more commercial friendly web 2.0. And I kind of felt like that was worth rediscovering because like for video games, played on a computer screen, it kind of makes sense to use all the resources available to get a computer screen, including like visit habits of visual perception. Like I feel like most video games are still locked into experiencing things from the console era, like in that whole framework of perception was in fact, as totally nothing to do with 
the way you experience like heaving through the internet which is a far more fluid and far more like visually open experience for the most part so it made sense to like try and pick up some of that and throw it in so i'm going to go and try and go through some of the um like the other games i made in the process to making this extremely horrible slucky camera so i'm gonna see if i can get away with playing a um a web game if this will let me it's kind of a bit chunky oh i'm using this responsibly Okay, play crab.html. So I always wanted to like do that kind of visually open thing as web pages because it made more sense and like it was more easy to pe for people to find and drop out of. But unfortunately, I never really figured out a way to. Um, most of these are HTML5, so it's kind of hard to like package as an offline thing then put on a CD. So I kind of had to drop that idea for the most part. But I kind of experimented a lot with like little HTML pages as like a way to, I don't know, see what you could do in terms of like very use camera constructions and so forth. This might not work, so I might open something else in the meantime. Let's see. Yeah, Kobe Cash. <laughs> oh, it is open. Now he gets get the music. That's a beautiful sound. That's from the OPG Maker 2003, just like default soundtrack. So this is crab.html. You play as a crab. He complains, and like, you move around. This is his shell. You step outside, and then he's in the beach, and you move around. And there's like a, a big block of text that you, you're not really meant to read. You just look at it and scroll away. And then there's all these like, horrible jokes and stuff that's layered around. You play as a crab, and he's the one who talks as you move around. But he's not really necessarily the center of attention. Like, you can. If you want to see what's down here, you can just scroll and see what's down here. The crab is still talking as you move around. And this is the entire game, like there's nothing else from here. This is like seeing what things that the crab says as he moves. But um, yeah, just like even having that quality of a large open container and then just kind of your eyes not locked to one particular point within it. You can kind of float around absently within that and move more fluidly than being locked to one central game mechanic. And similarly with Kobe Castle. So this was actually made for a fantastic arcade jam, I think, maybe last year. And it's very, like, even by the standards of jam games, it's spectacularly incoherent. But the idea here is that you can move the camera around to like this aiming site. You can click through the text by this button here. And you can also like field around as the board. So if you want to, you can look at the board. You don't have to, like the board moves pretty slow and you just like sing, so you float around. So you can just kind of look around and see what other people are doing. Maybe check in with the board every now and then to make sure like nothing stupid has happened. And um, yeah, I don't know, it's kind of... Oh, and I also have one more um, thing I can show. So Magic Wands. This is like a relatively polished, if anything, kind of polished video game. But it's like the worst possible idea you can have for a video game because it's basically just wanting to make a Dragon Quest game. And um, so I wanted to make a Dragon Quest game as one does. But I didn't want to just like look at the Dragon Quest thing, so I came up with, I mean, Dragon Quest 7 did as well, and probably a bunch of other games where you rotate the camera around. So like you're still playing as this little guy with the sword and stuff like that. But as you want to, you can kind of move it around, which I think helps you like throw your eye off and helps you explore a little more. Um, yeah, so I'll also actually, um, I think I will play a little more of this so I can show you the way the prototypes are folded into it. So I'll go up here to the water zone. So here's the water zone. Um, not much to say. <laughs> I think it's pretty self-explanatory. And then it kind of feeds into this with this, like another existing prototype. And the great thing is that like this used to be a full game. like. I was kind of thinking, oh god, I have to spend like the next six months just, like making more fish and like making more rocks and moving between the fish and the rocks and stuff like that. But I was like, no, I, since I have that made, I can just drop it in for exactly one level and just never touch it again. <laughs> and I hope to do that. Like, like all this, a lot of this stuff is just kind of like old assets. Like that rogue was drawn for. I'll show you now. Actually, that was drawn for kind of the precursor of this project called Mr. Hotel. I'll turn off the 
music, I think, because it's pretty copyright. Or maybe I'll give it a few seconds. So it's the Yeti Lunch cover of Spooky because she did a cover of Spooky for some reason. So this is just a very like dopey game because I wanted to make a game where you could feel that in the car. So you're playing as Mr. Hotel. He loves hotels, so that's his like, gimmick. He moves into a hotel, like there's gonna be a thing where you move up the elevator. You talk to all these guys, like he drones on in the distance. But it was kind of a I didn't want to do the elevator. Like I didn't want to sit down and code that elevator. It just seemed like a hassle and it was just depressing me every time I thought of it. So I just destroyed the game. <laughs> but I kept the assets, like I kept that rug. So that rug and the character of Mr. Hotel or all that remain of Mr. Hotel. So let's see what other Oh yes. There's also um the MB is just another example of no, that's probably too long to those. Um so I'll show you a precursor to the postcards game called Postcards Wasn't One. So a lot of the game uses this kind of system of empty spray outlines on a vague, like infinite background. And part of that was based on early like games like Girls Garden for the um the old Sega game, which was like most old video games take place in the void, but this was a yellow void, and that meant a lot for me for some reason. So I kind of tried making this prototype just based on the same principles of like a little web game where you moved around the space, but that's all there is to it. <laughs> it never got past this. But just the, um, I don't know, because the, the sprite outlines moving across the color fields kind of seemed like they worked as like a way to get at the idea of like the way you perceive the video game as you were playing it. Like, it wasn't a solid object, it was more just kind of like a vague shape that you applied to different situations so that you kind of, you encountered this area as the other guy, but then you could just encounter it as empty space as well. And that's what eventually morphed into the full video game. So um, depending on how much time I have, I can just try playing through and talking through a little bit more. Yeah? yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what's the best way to... No, thank you. I tried going to one of the other postcard arcs. So like I say, this is kind of based on something that I can just give to people. So it's very um, mechanically simple. Like the big problem with the other games was that they required two forms of input to be able to move the player and move the camera. So the idea with this was just kind of like have a very loose panning system. So you still get that level of camera movement, but without having to kind of, everything in the game just uses the arrow keys. You don't have to use any other buttons. It's very, friendly and um, the camera system is just completely broken so that if you move just in one direction forever it just slowly starts rotating around the player until the player slowly just becomes a line because the camera is viewing them from the side at that point <coughs> but um, I don't know I kind of like that level of jankiness just because it does like you're almost moving off screen here so it is kind of harder to predict what's happening what you're meant to be doing um, yeah, so I, like I said, I'm go going to be making CD-ROMs out of this. I don't know if there's any other way to say it. Like, my plan is just like to spend the next year or so with the day job, just like keep adding and adding to this, and then just dump it somewhere, just like on some unsuspecting pages, and wash my hands of it. <laughs> there are bits of plot in here, like, I am interested in like, the idea of like, it's set in a hotel because hotels are kind of like very like video games. They're kind of like a not they're a structure, but a structure that's kind of absent from what it contains. So like a hotel with a hundred rooms is not that different from a hotel with ten rooms. It's just the same thing but bigger. Like video game levels, like there's not much difference. So kind of like that idea of um, building on affinities for websites and video games and hotels and trying to not like get at any specific message, but just like have a like four different points of view, like hotel, video game, landscape, postcard, and just like having them kind of bang against each other in interesting ways. Which I think is generally kind of, I'm not a big fan of consciousness. I think if I was, I wouldn't be making video games. So I think like what's interesting about video games to me is the fact that they kind of let you get away from that. Like you at the very base level of consciousness with just like looking at something and just input up, up, down, left, left, right. And whatever happens, you're kind of, you're still filtering it through that. So it's kind of a very pure way of um, noticing the way that your consciousness works, because it's like, like ex sorry, estranged 
in this kind of yeduga here. So this lady, Pesky, she is your consciousness and you get to watch her move around and just like drifts and you're kind of watching it and you're also playing as it and there's kind of a level of not sinking up there which I, I guess level, the practice of making video games is just like constantly doing things with feel right and then it's trying to think of the justification for them afterwards. So I guess that's as close as I've been able to come from to justifying what interests like this banal practice for me. <laughs> So this is the pinball table. The pinballs go into the hotel. They moved around from different systems. Actually, they're just randomly moved. And then they get like a little dining table. There's a little clothing room. There's bedrooms for the hotels. They're clunking around. Like, they're free of being moved from the flippers. You too can be free of being moved by the flippers. And yeah, I'm just going to be adding to this and adding to this and adding to this and just with no purpose whatsoever, just like as close to automatic writing as I can get it. <laughs> just, I used to, I started out making video games from RPG Maker, like RPG Maker is still what I think of when I think of making video games, and it's so beautiful because it really is like, I don't know, it makes William Burroughs look like Mr. Rogers or something, like as soon as you open RPG Maker, it doesn't matter what your plans are, like you're just locked into tile, tile, grass, tree, tile, grass, tree, river, river, and then you wake up like 80 hours later and think, why did I spend 80 hours like making a sewer dungeon? And you don't know, but it happens and it's beautiful. <laughs> so I kind of, I guess like interaction with video games is kind of meant interaction with like the art side of video games, and I like that as well, but there's always been a part of me that's kind of yearned for the pre apsarian world of just making these like horrible, immoral block zones just over and over again. So I've just been trying to recapture that as much as I can. So everything I do is just like, it's kind of sneaky. It kind of seems like it could be art or it could be creative or it could be interesting, whatever that means. But it's really just like an enormous mechanism that enables me to just spend hours of my life just moving things around, dragging and dropping them on a computer screen and not knowing what that even means. And this is my multimedia game. Um, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> I feel like that was pretty straightforward. I'm, I'm, oh, here. So I, I noticed that you mentioned like some text is the player is not meant to read. It's like it's this giant wall of, of, of stuff. How does your creative process change between writing that sort of text versus stuff that you intend the player to read? Um, I think it's just like an awareness of like how snappy is. I mean, they can read it if they want, but I feel like making video games involves like two totally different forms of like intellectual labor. One is just like the very fancy open the air idea of like, this is what I want to do. This is how I express myself. And then the other half is just like actually sitting down and trying to implement that. Like, uh, that can't do that, can't do that. Too tired, too lazy, that's stupid, not gonna do that. So you end up with this like very chopped and screwed kind of version of your own consciousness and hopes and dreams and so forth. So I think like, if I come up with a piece of writing that I like, I can drop it in, but no one will, like, I still like it, but it won't work in this context. So if I actually, if it's something that the game needs to function, like, if it's like a point where the player can look at, and they'll like push them on to looking at the next thing, or if it's a piece of information that will make the rest of the game more interesting to them, I just had to cut it down into something that, that kind of like choppy video game cadence, like, that very unnatural, not particularly any kind of person, but just like a disembodied voice from the void. This kind of bizarre melange of like slangy friendliness, but also total impersonality. So that's kind of think the true voice of video games. And then if it's just like flavor text, I just leave it as flavor text and move on. So I'm afraid that's it. Do you have any, any other questions? Uh, I have a question. How many how many postcards are there so far? There are three. I'm thirty percent of the way through the postcards. Um, they are very slowly. I'm very slowly building more and more and more environments, and then every so often I get a postcard from my friend, and it's just kind of like a little extra impetus to finish off the environments. Or if not, I just kind of leave it and put it aside for later and bring it back. But there will eventually be ten postcards. You have my word. 
Have you ever gotten lost in one of your own games? No. <laughs> <laughs> they make sense at the time, like all video games do. I think about like the earlier talk about Wilmot's Warehouse. Like, if you're making it, you think like, oh, it makes sense because you go up here, like chasing mice through a tunnel. The mice come from the luxury zone because they eat like coats and they steal carpets. So you follow them through the pipes, they have their own little carpet warehouse. So it's very cut and dry and very sensible. <laughs> so I've never been able to like, also I don't know how to do anything in video games. Like I have no technical expertise whatsoever. Like I've been using the same like 10 Unity scripts for the past seven years. <laughs> and I've no idea like how to randomly generate, how to procedurally generate. So there's really, the way that like the process of making games surprises me. It's just like throwing in different assets and like seeing how they collide with each other as you move around as little and protagonist or whatever. But outside of that, I've never been able to, I don't know, surprise myself that thoroughly. Like maybe 10% of the way through when I'm still coming up with ideas, but after that, it's still like 80% is just, how can I finish this off? And then the last 10% is just like, I never want to do that again. That was the worst decision I ever made in my life. Next time I'll get it right. Next time I'll finish things off. Next time I'll like live a better life. And it never happened. <laughs> So no, I'm afraid not. <laughs> one day, one day I'll forget about all my other games and just like go back, and I'll be able to like experience some fresh sensations of disgust, as if I was, <laughs> as if I really were one of my own players. But it's it's a distant dream. So I had a question about uh, order of operations, sort of. Um, I noticed some of these have these really lovely handmade backgrounds, and then others have backgrounds that are maybe more assembled of components. And I wondered if um, there's a, a sort of order of assembly that varies depending on like which environment it is. It kind of felt, feels that way looking at it. Yeah, very much. Like it's very much, um, it was kind of created because I like the idea of a use process that can accommodate whatever I feel like working on at the time. Like if I just want to play with plasticine, if I want to draw pixels, if I want to paint, and they can all be like used in different places. So I kind of definitely want to have as many things going on as possible so that if I just feel like, or I have a particularly like wretched idea one day, I can just throw it in, like, here's a picture of my freezer because every video game needs an ice zone. And it doesn't connect to anything, but it was just kind of fun, just like being able to have an excuse, like a fictional excuse, so that I would just take a photograph of my own freezer, which I wouldn't ordinarily do, maybe. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I guess it's like not, a very um, internal, it's not grounded in like the internal logic of the game itself, it's more grounded in, I guess the struggle is like to see if there's a way to reconcile like whatever arbitrary half-ass shit I feel like doing with like the supposedly more formal and more sensible logic of an artistic project. So you kind of have these two opposing orders that are just like banging back and forth like plastic Spider-Man figures, you just like crash them against each other and like you hope that that simulates the dialectic between them. but. <laughs> It's really just a, um, just a fake struggle. But yeah, I like going back and forth. So that's what I do. Did that answer the question? Oh, thank you. Are you like motivated by hatred and scorn of video games or is it more like love and celebration? It's hatred and scorn. Okay. <laughs> I thought so, but I was just double checking. They want to put words in your mouth. No, I don't know what it is. Like I'm not, I don't try to be negative about it, but I don't know, it always seems to work more for me. Actually, I think it's like a good positive thing because whenever I start making a video game, like, I'll show you one now, I guess. Like a different video game, like, um, like say Super Eagle. So this is the Wolfenstein clone. This is like the original Wolfenstein. Wolfenstein is the clone of this, actually. So this is another collaboration with Winter Lake and their new Vaders. So I always go by the eagle, because that's canonical mode. But yeah, so like, this is made as like a, um, like Winter came up with this as like a pastiche of stuff like Wolfenstein, like the swastikas all over everything, but you're not actually fighting, like it's not historical. It's never suggested that you're fighting Nazis. You're just like shooting guys who just are covered with swastikas and who live in the chamber covered in swastikas. And it's like, it's kind of like playing with stuff like Bionic Commando, which has all that imagery, which just like has no actual use for it whatsoever. And um, so I guess it's like it started off just like making fun of something. But like you throw it into the game and then by 
like you start off making fun of Wolfenstein and then by the end of it you're just like moving around just like shooting guys and saying like yeah I like it what was the, what, what was the question again I, what I just know I gotta get you this door give me a second and then I would what yeah I guess Wolf, yeah I like Wolfenstein so I don't know I guess it's like a healthy thing because it always starts off with an attitude of like disgust because I guess it's like the quintessential like I don't know experimental thing like you don't do new things because the new things are good you didn't from like being bored and disgusted with the old things but then in the process you find like I don't know you just lose track of yourself you forget what you're trying to do and um, you think on balance like you no matter how critical you are at the beginning you kind of end up in this like very woolly very like Jimmy Buffett state of mind where whatever whatever you do like it seems good like this is guy it seems fun so um yeah, it's mostly hidden disgust, but I'm always happy when like it transforms into not love, but um, <laughs> I guess like affable incomprehension. I think that's a good note to end on. I like oh, that a lot. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen.